Hello, Dr. Joe here of the DrJoe.com. So, I've been trying to get into the concept of cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT as it's called, uh, as it relates to stress and anxiety. A lot of people who've got high blood pressure have issues with anxiety, and of course, stress is always around the corner. So, how can one actually use cognitive behavioral therapy to deal with stress and anxiety? Um, so I've been trying to understand this concept and uh, I got in touch with a clinical psychologist, uh, Seth Gillihan. Uh, he holds a PhD in psychology and uh, I decided to have a chat with him about uh, how CBT you know, can be used to manage stress and anxiety. So here is how our conversation went. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got uh, Seth Gillihan here, a PhD, he's a clinical psychologist. And uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about stress and anxiety because, uh, in particular, anxiety, because a, a lot of us who've got high blood pressure, we've got problems with anxiety. And uh, it's probably a good idea we know how to deal with that for us to be able to deal with uh, high blood pressure issues. So uh, we're going to have a little chat about that. And he's particularly interested in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And we're going to delve into that as well. So, uh, Seth, uh, please welcome to uh, the uh, uh, this interview. Um, now, anxiety is very common in the population, uh, as as you know. Uh, can we start by talking about how anxiety actually affects uh, the individual, uh, generally speaking? Yes, yes. Thank you, Joe. It's great to be here, and it's a good question about how anxiety affects us. So. Part of what makes anxiety so challenging to deal with is that it involves a lot of different components. Okay. So there's the, there's the attentional component. So anxiety grabs our attention and it directs it toward the future, toward danger out there. It makes us focus on possible threats. So we're biased towards seeing things as dangerous, as threatening. It also affects our bodies, our, our physiology, which I know this is something that's, that's close to your heart and, yeah. and central yeah. to your work, the, this activation of our sympathetic nervous system, this fight or flight response you can feel in your body, the tension, the feeling of agitation that that creates, and it affects our whole systems from our, from our eyeballs uh, down to our toes. So uh, in the, the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis, turns on, so cortisol is released from our adrenal glands on top of our kidneys, we feel that. So that's, so attention, our physiology, our thoughts are affected, so we tend to see things as being threatening or dangerous, and our behavior is affected. So we tend to avoid things, move away from things that are anxiety provoking. So together, I don't think we experience all those things as individual components. It usually just feels like a big mess and feels like being overwhelmed but we can pull them apart to maybe address them more effectively. Now, the other thing is, uh, in relation to that, uh, of course, we don't live in isolation. We, also, we live with you know, family members and uh, we live with, or we work with colleagues. So what's the effect of anxiety on people around us? Because I think uh, it, there's gotta be an effect. Uh, the way we behave, I suppose, uh, will affect our family members as well as you know, work colleagues. Yes. Yes, it's a great point. Anxiety is a highly energized state and it tends to kind of radiate to the people around us. They generally know when we're feeling anxious, especially if we're being irritable or uh, you, you know, we're, we're distracted or not really focused. I know for myself, if I'm in a particularly stressed and anxious state, I can be kind of short with my kids or not as, as patient as I would like to be. So, so yeah, anxiety can really be a social experience. So in a way, uh, if, we, if we're able to identify how our behavior is affecting others, and we know that we can self-diagnose ourselves that, oh, actually, I think I'm feeling a little bit anxious, I'm feeling a bit stressed, that can help us to pull back and maybe alter your behavior accordingly. Yes, yeah, and I think, and that self-awareness is so important. I mean, there are definitely times I, mean, I, I encourage people I work with in this way and, and in my own life too, I'll, I'll notice, you know, 
wow, I am, I mean, it could be anxiety, it could be something else, could be fatigue, but it's noticing I'm not at my best right now. And, and it is easy for me to imagine reacting to someone in a way that I'm going to regret. But if I know in advance, if I have that self-awareness, okay, I'm in this state right now, then I can question those, those kind of knee jerk, you know, uh, irritable responses and say, you know what, I have the impulse to lash out now, but that's really coming from inside. It's not about what's happening around me. It's really about what's going on inside that anxiety or something else. And so, yeah, so we can check ourselves if we're more self-aware. So that, that helps. So um, I think we can now talk about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is, you know, something that you're passionate about. Uh, can we, uh, can you explain what CBT actually is um, to, to my uh, audience, please? Yes. Yes. So cognitive behavioral therapy is a, it's a combination of, of I mean, as, as the name suggests, cognitive therapy and behavioral therapy. It also often now includes mindfulness too. So, so briefly, the cognitive part is just taking a closer look at our thoughts and the stories that we tell ourselves, the way we interpret situations, the expectations we have for the future, and realizing that those automatic reactions, those automatic thoughts that we have, aren't the only way of seeing things. So if my loved one does something and I think, ah, oh, they're being so disrespectful, that's an interpretation. Maybe they're actually preoccupied with something else and not intending to be disrespectful. And so when we change our thoughts, first by noticing them, and then by adjusting them to be more realistic and helpful, it can really revolutionize everything about our experience, including our behavior. Now the behavior part is, again, it starts with that self-awareness, understanding what our, our patterns are, understanding uh, you know, if I, if I have a tendency to move away from something when I'm feeling anxious, to avoid you know, going for a walk, if I'm uh, afraid of, of bumping into someone I don't want to see, then you know, noticing the effects of that and you know, adjusting my behavior in a more intentional direction. So I'm not just you know, reacting to these kind of short-term uh, rewards or, or pushes, uh, but doing things really that are more important to me. And fact, we can talk more about that if, uh, if that's of interest. And, yeah. and mindfulness is just bringing greater presence and openness and awareness to our experience. And it includes things like meditation, but really we can bring this quality of presence to anything we do. We can experience, you know, talking with someone in a mindful way, really being, being present and tuned in. We can take a shower mindfully. And, and these three components all work together and complement each other. So what, what are the three components? The, the cognitive, the behavioral, and what's the third one? And mindfulness, oh, mindfulness. mindful awareness. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a, it's a, so together CBT is a type of treatment that tends to be fairly short term. It can be just like six to eight sessions or so. It's uh, very problem focused. So it's, it's not kind of as broad exploratory. Let's, let's talk about, you know, your earliest memories type of therapy, but more about, you know, what's getting in your way now and what kinds of changes can we make in the short term that are gonna, gonna pay off for you the most. Uh, and, it's, and it's very collaborative, kind of looking for ways that the, the therapist and the, and the client can work together to come up with some solutions. Okay, so the different arms of CBT, uh, were they developed uh, together or were they independently developed and then eventually became integrated? Can we go, Great let's question. go into the history of, of the, uh, this therapy. If, if yeah, you yeah. Yeah. Now, these are good questions. So the behavioral part uh, came before the cognitive part. Okay. This came like around the, the 50s. People like uh, Dr. Joel, Joseph Volpe were, were uh, they really were interested in applying behavioral principles that had been discovered in the lab, things related to like uh, conditioning, operant conditioning and classical conditioning, uh, seeing if we could apply those things to human behavior to make uh, short-term effective treatments that didn't require kind of the hours on the couch that psychoanalytic treatment uh, required. So, and, and they really weren't interested in what they call the black box of, of the mind, 
to, to them, behavior is all that counted. Everything else was just kind of guesses. But then in the 60s, people like Aaron Beck and Albert Ellis came along and they said like, you know what? Actually, the things that we're thinking and the stories that we tell ourselves have a big effect on our emotions and our behaviors and of course on our relationships and our health. So they paid more attention to those, those types of thoughts because they realized when we're in really heightened emotional states, our thoughts tend to move in a predictable direction that isn't helpful to us. So if I'm really angry, for example, I'm going to tend to see things through that lens of anger. I'm going to interpret things in a way they're going to, going to continue to stoke that anger. So those, those two developed uh, kind of back to back uh, a number of decades ago. The mindfulness approach is interesting. Actually, I think with all of these, the principles have been around for thousands of years. You know, the cognitive therapy looks a lot like principles of stoicism, you know, from the around, you know, the transition from uh, BC to, to AD. Um, but then, you know, the, the innovation, I think, in these treatments is really putting them together into a, a package, into a program that can be applied systematically, it can be targeted, to conditions that we care about. So mindfulness approaches really developed uh, around like late 70s, early 80s, into the 90s and, and continuing now. So it's considered the third wave of CBT. But again, mindfulness, I mean, this, this goes back to you know, mystical traditions from thousands of years ago, you know, Hindu uh, approaches, other, other Eastern traditions, some uh, branches of, of other religions that have more of that mindfulness component. So I guess part of what I love about CBT is that it's, it's new and, and considered cutting edge on the one hand, but it also has such deep roots. It goes back uh, you know, about as far as we want to look. These ideas have been around. Yeah, so essentially, you know, they, they are things that we've been doing, but we never really packaged them together into one unit. And uh, some people became smart enough to say, actually, this this works uh, because we're talking about the present and if it works uh, how can we streamline it into a sort of therapy so essentially that's what's happened here that's a really nice way of describing it yes streamline it make it efficient yeah so um would i be right in saying that well the cognitive the behavioral and of course now the mindfulness they sort of are complementary to each other they feed into each 100%. other percent yes Yes, exactly. The thoughts we have affect our behaviors. If, if I realize something is not as dangerous as I think, I'm going to be more likely to, to approach it. And if I realize, all right, the worst that's going to happen if I give this talk is people might be a little bit bored, but it's not going to be worse than that. Then I'm more willing to approach it. Or if, I, if I'm avoiding something, but then I face that fear, that, that is likely to change my thoughts. So our behaviors change our thinking. And I, I think of mindfulness as the space in which all of these, uh, our thoughts and our actions unfold. And depending on the quality of, of presence and attention that we bring to our experience, that changes the quality of our thoughts and our actions. So I can, I can notice that I'm thinking, which changes my relationship with my thoughts. I'm not totally lost to them, but I realize like, oh, I'm having this anxious thought. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not where I can be more deeply in my experience, in my actions, if I bring that presence, that, that sense of connection to the moment. Excellent. So the, from what you're saying now, the, the essential difference between traditional uh, forms of psychotherapy um, will be the fact that the traditional forms of therapy tend to take a retrospective look at a patient's history translate that into the present uh, whereas cbt focuses on today what is happening right now and uses that to help the anxious uh, patient so you, you we're talking about traditional therapy focuses on the past and then cbt more or less focuses on the present would i be right in thinking that's the difference between the two i think that's a that's a fair generalization now there's a lot of overlap so there are a lot of non-CBT therapies that also tend to focus more on the present, or at least to, to strike a balance between past and, and present. Because I think all therapies, you know, want to help people in 
you know, what they're dealing with now. They just have somewhat different approaches in how they do that. And conversely, in CBT, we don't ignore the past. We just don't necessarily uh, expect that by understanding the past or having insights about the past by itself changes the present and helps us to affect our future. But more about you know, if we do understand the patterns we have developed in the past and how we continue to enact those, then we can change those in the present to change our, our experience. But, but in general, yes, I think there's more of a focus on the present in CBT on average than other types of therapy. Yeah, but the, the, when you're talking about CBT sort of still draws on the past, you probably will be referring to the immediate past as opposed to something that happened in my childhood, um, being bearing a relationship to what is happening to me now as, as to what I'm feeling now. I think the, the CBT go that far, like events in childhood. It certainly can, yes. Yes, so Judith Beck, uh, who's the a psychologist, uh, daughter of Dr. Aaron Beck, who developed uh, cognitive therapy, one of the worksheets that she uses to understand our core beliefs, so the, the, the types of underlying beliefs that drive our daily thoughts, one of the part of that, uh, f that, that form, that exercise, involves looking back at, even at childhood experiences, at, at these antecedent effects. So, so we don't want to ignore the past or, because there, is, there are often are clues there, if a person has a history of trauma, if they've been abused, neglected, or, or just kind of everyday patterns in our family relationships, those types of things matter, but we don't leave it there. We don't say, okay, so now you've understood that, now you have this moment of insight, and suddenly something clicks and things are different. It's great if that happens, but most of the time it's more about, okay, I understand that's where this seems to have, have come from or may have originated, and now what can I do about it in the present? Because those whatever we learned or, or carried with us from the past tends to take on a life of its own becomes what we call functionally autonomous so it's it's kind of disconnected from the past even if that's where it originated so we 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 understand that that change has to happen in the in the present but it can definitely help to understand where those dynamics developed so uh, i mean cbc has been around now for probably you said the, the early part of the 20th century and then the middle part, uh, that's when it began to take hold. Uh, having been around for that long and being something that is becoming more trendy, if you like, uh, today, uh, do we have any scientific backing as to the effectiveness of CBT? Yes, yes. That's one of the real strengths of CBT is that, that because it, it can be uh, developed into these structured programs that those can be tested scientifically in, in rigorous clinical studies okay. and compared to a, a, like a wait list or some type of placebo, either like a pill placebo or it's called a psychological placebo. Yeah. So maybe, you know, still, still meeting, still talking about things, but it doesn't have the active cognitive behavioral and, and, and often mindfulness components. So for, for anxiety, for example, we know that for all the anxiety conditions, if you compare an active CBT treatment to uh, a placebo, you get a significant effect uh, and, and in some cases a large effect. So that's a really significant finding because there tends to be a large placebo response for a lot of psychological conditions. Yeah. So getting a, an effect above and beyond kind of the, the general effects of meeting with someone for example, or, or taking a pill that you think is going to be helpful. That's, uh, that, that suggests that the treatments are powerful. And, and the majority of people who complete treatment programs for anxiety will see a lot of benefit. Yeah, because I think I read somewhere, um, there was an article in one of our journals a couple of years ago, where they talked about the most consistent antidepressant that actually works in every uh, study. Um, and they said it was placebo. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's amazing for dep depression, for example, placebo response can be like 50% yeah. compared to the pill response, yeah. 60%, so yeah. an additional 10% advantage. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So can we use um, CBT to 
address unpleasant feelings like hopelessness, fear, anger, distress? Is this something that CBT can tackle? Yes. Yes, that's actually one of the most common uh, applications of CBT. So it, it can help us, first of all, to understand that uh, the, the different components of those, those emotions. You know, as I was suggesting before, with anxiety, you can break it down into, you know, where's our attention, what's happening in our body, etc. And then, then from there, we can direct those different, uh, those different parts of the treatment, the, you know, addressing our thoughts, addressing our behaviors, practicing mindful presence at, the, at each of those, those aspects of that emotion. And it tends to be highly effective. Right. Okay. So, um, can, can you give me a practical example of how CBT uh, focuses on thoughts and behavior and then provides relief? Um, I, I know because you, you do see patients, so I would imagine that, um, you know, you probably may have just an example to see how. So, my audience can understand how CBT can actually help them. So for instance, if I've got anxiety that is affecting my sleep, how can I use CBT to relieve that? Great, great question. And anxiety does so often affect our sleep. And CBT for insomnia is uh, one of the most effective treatments. So, so we, we want to start uh, with you know, in, introducing the, the CBT model and talking about you know, what are your what are your experiences? What's a part of your anxiety? And what are the specific thoughts that seem to be driving that anxiety? Then we can take a closer look at those together. So let's say, for example, actually, Joe, do you have any, any specific examples that come to mind what a person might be anxious about, what they might be experiencing? Let's say, um, what was the most common? Uh, most common could be something like, oh, I've got to I give uh, public speaking, you know, I've got to give a talk uh, tomorrow. And uh, you sort of think, ooh, all right, this is something I haven't done before. If you're going to do it for the first time, and now you have an audience of about, you know, four, 5,000 people, that can be intimidating, uh, especially if it's your first experience. Um, how do you deal with something like that? And then, so the night before, because maybe a week before you're fine, but as the day draws nearer, you sort of think, ooh, this is, this is for real now. Um, and then the night before, you have problems falling asleep because you're so worried about what's going to happen uh, tomorrow. Uh, can you hack it? <laughs> Are you going to yes. fail? <laughs> so I, I cannot deal with that. Yeah, yeah. And now it's real. Now I can't ignore it. Now I can't yeah. pretend like it's exactly. <laughs> so far in the future, I don't have to think about it. Yeah. So yeah, lots of things we can do. It's a great example and a common one. So I would start with mindful acceptance. And that means just accepting a number of things. One is you're going to be anxious. Like, of course you are. So, you so that, that acknowledgement is very important. Yes, yes, definitely. Because we'll often get into the struggle, like, oh, I can't be anxious, I need to stop being anxious, why am I anxious? Yeah. But to just say, you know what, anxiety is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. We don't want it to, to run away with itself, but, yeah. but it just says I care about something that's uncertain, that's in the future. So, so you're going to be anxious, all right, be anxious, uh, except that you know, sleep may not be great, that you know, may not sleep as well as usual. I'll probably do fine. You know, one poor night of sleep generally doesn't wreck our behavior, especially if we're going to be, you know, highly energized for that event. You know, if it's a race the next day or we're giving a talk, you're going to be up for it. So, I don't mean awake. I mean you're going to be your energy and and uh, attention are going to be up. So lay that foundation: mindful acceptance, mindful presence, and then notice what thoughts are going through your mind. Maybe something like. What if I forget my speech? What if I uh, sound stupid? What if people are bored? And bring acceptance to those thoughts too. Accept that, of course, my mind is going to be looking for, for danger because it wants to protect me. Accept that. And accept that those things are possible. Maybe people will be bored, right? Maybe I won't give an entirely smooth delivery. Maybe there are times where I'll trip over my words. But thinking about it tonight 
and trying in advance to make sure that that doesn't happen tomorrow is totally not only Careful. ineffective, yeah. right, but counterproductive. Because yeah. now I'm lying in bed trying to control this speech that isn't going to happen for another 12 hours or something. Yeah. So, so, you know, checking those thoughts and not getting into a struggle with them, like, oh yeah, what if I forget? Okay, so I have to make sure I don't forget. But accepting there's going to be uncertainty. We're not going to know exactly how things are going to go. And then, you know, behavior-wise, to do the things that tend to prepare us well, uh, maybe the, you know, the, the night of, we might do some, you know, an extended winding down routine at night to, to maybe control some of that physiological arousal to help our bodies to clear probably an excess cortisol production that we're dealing with. Uh, and, and then the next day have a plan for what we're going to do, how we're going to approach things. But Joe, I like to think of this as w when we're, when we're working in CBT, I like to think of it as training okay. that we're actively training ourselves in a different way. And so, so here we could use it as an opportunity in advance to ask myself, okay, how do I want to think? tomorrow? What, what types of things do I want to be telling myself before those negative stories show up, before the, those images of failure fill my mind? Maybe I'll tell myself things like, I've prepared the best I can. I know my material. All I can do is the best I'm going to do. And I can't ultimately control how things go or how people receive it. So the cognitive part would be uh, to acknowledge that uh, there's going to be anxiety. Uh, and it's, it's normal for me to feel anxious about this. Um, and then the behavioral part will be to say, right, let me prepare very well. Being prepared means I'm more likely to succeed. Is that the way it works? Uh, A, acknowledge that being anxious is normal. And then you now have to tailor yourself towards the behavioral part. So what am I going to do to make sure that what I'm anxious about does not happen? Well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't quite go that far because how do we know the thing we're anxious about isn't going to happen? And can we yeah. guarantee that it's not going to happen? Okay. So I think that's where the mindful part comes in is to accept, I can do everything in my power to have success. I think as you suggested a minute ago, I liked that, that the way you said it, that we can uh, make it more likely that we'll succeed. But if we try to make sure that we succeed because anxiety hates uncertainty. So it's going to look for that 100% guarantee, yeah. that's going to keep us chasing that feeling of certainty because in the end, we can do everything we, we can think of, but then we're left in the same place. But what if, what if I fail tomorrow? So we can accept like, all right, I'm going to do what I can and then release the outcome because it's not ultimately in my hands. Excellent. So what about, um, let me just give another example again, because um, I know that one member of my forum, his blood pressure is no longer behaving itself, mainly, and he does admit to the fact that uh, he's had a bereavement in his family. And uh, obviously that's affected him. And, and obviously because of that, he's not sleeping well and he's been to see his doctor. And naturally uh, what we do as doctors is we just give antidepressants. So uh, he's been given citalopram. Um, and uh, obviously antidepressants, sometimes they actually do affect your sleep pattern as well. So that is not even helping matters. So how will somebody like him, because when we're talking about something like bereavement, it's not something that goes away, you know, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So how does one deal with, you know, events like, you know, bereavement, you know, loss of a loved one? Um, yeah, how, how, how can CBT help? Or is, mm. or is it possible for CBT to be helpful in those situations or not, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, this is an important point. I mean, my, my approach, I think in general, in, in, in CBT and probably therapy uh, more broadly, is we don't want to over-pathologize those types of states and assume, oh, you're feeling anxious, uh, you know, about this huge upheaval in your life, or you're feeling... Know, bereaved at this enormous loss, maybe we could call it CBT to 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 say like let's let's look at you know beliefs you have about uh, you know criticizing yourself or feeling the way that you feel and and work instead toward opening to that experience. Um, but but I I really tend to trust the the human spirit and psyche to go through that process, whether it's grief or or dealing with uh, the stress 
in our lives and and to expect there is going to be some uh, some you know, difficulty in going through those experiences but uh, and if if it continues, so, so that, that, sorry, sorry to interrupt. That that goes the acknowledgement again. You've got to really acknowledge the fact that uh, this is normal to feel this yes. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it's that said, you know, I don't want to minimize if if someone's experience is you know, if they're feeling totally overwhelmed, or, you know, by the by their uh, emotions, uh, by their grief, for example, or uh, if it goes on, it just goes on and on and on. It doesn't seem to be to be getting any better. Um, then it may be helpful to, to talk with someone. It may be CBT that's helpful, uh, but it could just be support. It could just be more you know, sort of expressing what's, what's, uh, what they're going through and getting someone else's perspective, uh, maybe releasing some things that have been pent up. Um, and then if, I, I do think CBT, you know, some of the things we've talked about could be useful, but again, I'd want to, I'd want to tread lightly on those types of experiences and, and really find out where the person is before assuming, okay, you need to you know, shift the way you're thinking about this or, or do something different. It may be more, more time and, and love that are needed. And it's also possible that maybe an individual may have some other overriding issues. For instance, you, one loses their spouse and the spouse is probably the main income earner. Um, that is, so you've got two issues to deal with there. One is the fact that there's a loss so you got that to deal with. Plus, now you're also thinking about loss of income uh, because he or she was the main income earner for the household. So those kind of issues, they, they can collide and just um, probably make one's emotions to implode. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect storm in a way. And, and on top of all that, that stress and, and, up and, and turmoil, you don't have a person to talk to that you normally would talk to about exactly those things. Right. So um, I think you do have deck cards, don't you? You got some, haven't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. So how, yeah, do, the original... yeah, yeah. How, how do they work? Yeah, actually. Yeah. What a coincidence. Got some? I have right here. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, so yeah, tell, tell us how, how the, the deck cards work and how we can actually use them. Please. Yes. Yes. This is actually, I want to pull this out because this is a new deck. This one is specifically for anxiety, rumination, and worry. So more about the things we're talking about today. Yeah. So there are three types of cards um, yeah. and each one corresponds to one of the, the components of mindfulness centered CBT. Okay. So one, one card is labeled think. All right. Okay. And then some, some are labeled act. There okay. it is. And then some are labeled B. Yeah. So, so think is cognitive, act obviously is behavioral, behavioral and yeah. is mindfulness. So I'll just pick one, pick a card, any card at random here. Okay. So this one says, this is a think card. All right. Cognitive technique. It says, well, what's the story? That's the title. Yeah. Anxiety creates stories about bad things that might happen. It sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. When you're feeling anxious today, write down what anxiety is telling you, noting that it's simply a story. For example, anxiety is telling me a story about how I'm going to fail. Getting our anxious thoughts out of our heads and onto paper makes it easier to see them as fiction rather than reality. So, you know, there are 108 practices like that in the card. And the idea is, I mean, you, know, you can use them however you want, but probably most often people take one card per day. You can take it with you, which I think is you know, part of the beauty of, of having these on individual cards. And just use it as a reminder to practice that, you know, once, twice, a few times throughout the day. Because what I really want is, is for these practices not to just stay on paper or within a therapy session, but to infuse our lives. That's the real power of CBT is in the practice and in the application. To bring so them to the practical the, level. Yes, practical. Yeah. So, um, so, so you've got, you got the three types. So you've got the think, act, and be. And we just pull... Each of those cards at random or? I, I mean, I think I, I prefer to just pick one at random. I use them myself sometimes. Um, I mean, they, they come, you know, originally they're uh, all the think cards are together, act cards, B cards. Uh, but I think it's nice to, to, to shuffle uh, them. Yeah, shuffle them. Right. And then, and then just take, you know, that way you're not, you know, just doing cognitive stuff and then, you know, spending a month doing just behavioral things. 
but you're kind of balancing around and finding how these these things interact together. And as I was writing the cards, I tried to make them, uh, you know, to, to integrate some of the, the, the different components together. Okay. So a mindfulness card might have a cognitive approach in it. Ah, excellent. Oh, that's nice. Um, and they are they are available with your book or are they are they independent? I can't remember oh, now. Um, so these cards are available independently on Amazon. My other card deck, which is more, more general, is called the CBT deck. That one's available on Amazon too, but I also include it when people take one of my online courses called Calm, which is a 24 lesson course in mindfulness centered CBT. It's included there so they can continue their practice. Oh, excellent. So uh, talking about your deck cards, that brings us nicely to your book, uh, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Made Simple. So can you just tell us a little bit about your book? And uh, yeah, and I'll tell my um, subscribers to go get it, please. Terrific. Yes, yes. This is a book I wrote a couple of years ago, uh, really trying to, to bring these principles to as many people as possible in a way that's really easy to digest and understand and return to as needed. So it's, it's uh, 10 chapters on you know, different, different uh, ways of applying CBT. And I organized that book in the Think Act B framework as well. So, so, it's, uh, so I, I like those just three you know, easy reminders of uh, ways we can respond when we're having challenging emotions. And I address you know, anger, uh, anxiety, uh, depression, uh, as well as just kind of general self-care and relationships in that book. So that, uh, like the others, is available where everything else is on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I'll leave links below. Uh, if you're watching this video and you want to get a copy of uh, Seth's, uh, Gillihan's uh, book, uh, there are going to be links right below this video. Um, as usual, uh, it's going to be the pinned comment. Uh, so it's going to be the very first comment right below the video and also in the video description as well. So, um, you know, Seth, it's, it's been very nice talking to you today. Uh, thanks for taking time to, uh, um, you know, do this interview. Maybe at some point, we might have a live session with, you know, my audience at some point in future. Uh, that's something we'll sort out uh, at, at a later date. Uh, so yeah, it's been nice talking to you. Thank you very much for taking time off on a very nice Saturday uh, to have this interview and uh, talk to you sometime. Thanks a lot. My pleasure, Joe. Thank you. So hopefully you got some value from this video. Now, as with concepts like this, you may need to watch this video more than once. Uh, the reason is that every time you watch the video, you are probably going to pick up one or two more nuggets from Seth. So do come watch this interview. It's here. It's live. Come watch it any day, any time, okay? Now, the next thing you want to do is to get Seth's book, okay? Because uh, the book is going to complement a lot of the things he's mentioned here. And of course, the book is going to go into more detail. So the link to get the book is going to be right below this video. It's uh, called uh, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Made Simple. <laughs> so, you know, the title is quite descriptive. So uh, please get the book. Now, if you got some values so far from the video, give the video a thumbs up, please like the video, and also share this video with your friends, family, and colleagues. Uh, and uh, let me know your views about CBT. Is this something you've done before? Did it work for you? Did it not work for you? Uh, is this something you're going to consider if you've got stress and anxiety? And, um, you know, do you know anybody who's actually had a go at uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for whatever indication? It doesn't have to be stress or anxiety. Uh, let me know. And uh, I'd like to hear uh, all your views regarding uh, CBT as a form of uh, psychotherapy. Leave your views right down below, uh, as usual, in the commenting section. I think that's about it. Until next time, well, this is Dr. Joe signing out.